what is required to rejoin the European Union for the United Kingdom as a whole is for the United Kingdom as a whole to uh, make it clear to our ex-partners on the continent that we are now absolutely convinced of the cause of European integration. Uh, and that will entail, in my view, not just rejoining the single market and freedom of movement, um, but quite possibly a defence union, which is now on the cards. Um, obviously, the single currency. Um, and these, this requires an enormous um, transformation of, of British opinion. Hello, I'm Brendan Donnelly. I'm the director of the Federal Trust. And I'm going to be talking today with our chairman, John Stevens, about the new Liberal Democrat policy on, on Brexit and, and at relations with the European Union. Uh, Ed Davies said, John, earlier in the year that the Liberal Democrats were not going to be campaigning to reverse Brexit. Um, does this new policy reflect that? It does, in the sense that they've made it quite clear that they don't intend to rejoin the EU. What they are planning uh, is to move slowly towards rejoining the single market. Although I think the real import of the paper, uh, which incidentally was written by uh, Lord Newby, who used to be um, the advisor um, to Roy Jenkins. Uh, so it's, it's rather a um, a blast from the European, pro-European past. Um, I think what they, where they're likely to end up is some sort of Switzerland-style arrangement, um, though possibly without free movement. But in concrete terms, what they wish to do is to uh, have a series of confidence-building measures but, uh, with the EU, um, bilateral agreements improving recognition of qualifications, um, uh, Erasmus, uh, rejoining that in some form, uh, scientific research, uh, and then hope that that will lead to an ability to rejoin uh, the single market at some stage in the future. But as I say, the, the real atmosphere of the piece is very much ad hoc um, bilateral agreements on particular topics, which is really the Swiss model. Why have they adopted this policy? They, they used to pride themselves on being the most pro-European of the British parties. Um, uh, they were very much involved in the second referendum campaign. Um, what's changed? Well, they had rather a disastrous impact on the second referendum campaign. I, I think they were really responsible for precipitating the 2019 general election. Uh, and I think there are quite a few people who believe that had that election not been held, there would have been a very good chance of a a second referendum. Obviously, the position of Jeremy Corbyn in the Labour Party was 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 a problem too, um, as was the interests of the Scottish Nationalist Party, who, although they were supposedly very pro-European, they recognised that Brexit was very good for the nationalist cause. Uh, so I think that the, the, the Liberal position <laughs> has been, in many respects, rather destructive of the pro-European cause in, in the past. But being the most pro-European of the three main uh, national parties is not a very difficult achievement these days. And um, they have positioned themselves just on the pro-European side of the Labour Party. And they think that is where their political interests are best served. We'll talk about the Labour Party um, later. But do you think this is a, a coherent position in its own terms? Or is it simply a, 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 an armistice, a, a truce? between differing views within the Liberal Democrats? No, I think probably most Liberal Democrat members, at any rate, um, are quite pro-European in a, in a vague and, and, and general and perhaps more cultural sense. Um, this is really about the problems of being a national party and having to appeal both to parts of the country that voted strongly to leave the EU, traditional uh, areas of Liberal Democrat strength, such as the South West, and areas where they are hoping to make progress, where they think a, a, a somewhat more pro-European message makes sense in, in the southeast of England, in um, formerly conservative areas. Um, but also they have clearly pockets of support in the North as well. Um, 
some of which were remain and some of which were leave. So they have in miniature the same sort of problem as the Labour Party has in appealing across the country, uh, both sides of the referendum divide. It's all very well for a British political party to sketch out a, um, a roadmap and, time, not even, and a timetable, general timetable for rejoining the single market. Is that something that will be of interest to the European Union? Not really. Um, and in particular, the approach starting with uh, particular bilateral deals on specific topics, I think, is quite a difficult thing to do, except in a, the most minimalist way, because already the situation of Switzerland is causing uh, tremendous difficulties for the relationship uh, between the Swiss and the and the European Union. Um, and there is no appetite whatever to reproduce on a much larger scale and with a much more significant partner um, all the problems that they've got into um, with the Swiss road. So um, I think that um, although overall the European Union, of course, would like Britain, the United Kingdom, to rejoin the EU. Um, realistically, they would only wish to do that um, if there was a genuine commitment to the European project, to ever close the union, in essence. And that would require a, an enormous change in, in British um, attitudes towards Europe, uh, which at present seems uh, rather remote. And equally, I think there is quite an appetite um, in some parts of the continent uh, to see the way forward being bits of the UK rejoining the EU, obviously Northern Ireland via uh, an eventual reunification of Ireland, and also, of course, Scotland. Um, and that, I think, is seen as a much more plausible way of, of going forward and ensuring that uh, the people joining would be fully committed to the program. Yes, it strikes me that this um, Liberal Democrat um, approach um, is uh, uh, the latest iteration of the um, having your cake and eating it, being partly in, partly out. We want to cooperate on some things, but not on others. Do you think that um, uh, such an approach um, will be acceptable to the United Kingdom? Will British public opinion be won over by this? Um, this um, small steps approach? Well, the sharp end of, of this, I think, is in Scotland, because the Liberal Democrats, I think, may be hoping to uh, pick up some of the unionist support that is ebbing away from the Conservative Party because of its growing unpopularity in Scotland. Whereas previously, the Conservative Party was the, the main recipient of unionist support and the, and the Labour Party and, and the Liberals were eclipsed somewhat. I, I think the Liberals see their chance in Scotland of surviving um, being taking a more European line. I doubt, however, that will be very plausible because of the intense polarisation of Scottish politics on the uh, union, unionist, nationalist divide. And the fact that the nationalist cause is now very much identified with pro-Europeanism of rejoining the EU. But in the rest of the country, isn't there an issue about whether joining the single market uh, and being bound by its regulations, but not having any say in the establishment of those regulations would, would be uh, a politically controversial? Um, well, I, I think it's completely ludicrous proposition. I mean, the idea that a country the size of Britain, uh, the size of the United Kingdom, um, could accept uh, being a rule taker on every essential uh, regulation governing its economic uh, position, I think is completely fantastic. Um, and, and it would be extremely difficult to sell. Um, so the, the idea of, of unbundling the, the, the pro-European cause and, and going at it slowly, step by step, I think is a total illusion. What is required to rejoin the European Union for the United Kingdom as a whole is for the United Kingdom as a whole to uh, make it clear to our 
ex-partners on the continent, that we are now absolutely convinced of the cause of European integration. Uh, and that will entail, in my view, not just rejoining the single market and freedom of movement, um, but quite possibly a defense union, which is now on the cards. Um, obviously, the single currency. Um, and these, this requires an enormous um, transformation of, of British opinion. And um, the idea that you can creep up on this slowly without really talking about the difficulties, without particularly addressing issues as large as that of the single currency, um, I think is, is totally fantastic. Um, but obviously, the position in Scotland and Northern Ireland is, is, is different. You talked about the way in which uh, some continental commentators and politicians uh, envisage uh, the parts of the United Kingdom rejoining the European Union. Um, how realistic do you think that, um, that analysis is? Well, I regret to say, I think it is very realistic because uh, although there is a question of, of the time scale of this and the difficulty of it, um, I mean, Brexit has undoubtedly reopen the whole prospect of Irish unification, which our membership of the European Union had really um, led to it being a, um, a sleeping issue, uh, one that was everybody uh, on, on both sides of the, of the divide had, were prepared to, to push into the long grass. Um, that is no longer the case, I'm afraid. Um, and the prospects of a crisis in Northern Ireland um, with pressure for a border poll and the rest um, is growing, I think. Um, and we'll have to see what happens in, in the May elections. But um, the, the growth of Sinn Féin, both in the North and in the South, is very alarming. Um, and is so that, I think, is a, a, a real prospect, um, which will pose a significant challenge for, for the EU. Um, and equally, Although support for independence in Scotland remains very evenly divided, um, clearly uh, any difficulties in uh, the economy, um, any tensions um, over um, the, the position of uh, the, the status of, of Scottish devolution relative to London, um, all issues which are, are being um, uh, raised by this government in, in its approach to Scotland um, is likely to reopen this. H on what timescale, it's difficult to tell. I, I find it difficult to imagine that we will see a referendum uh, being seriously pushed for um, by the Scottish nationalists before the next general election. But I, I think that thereafter... Um, it, that is quite likely. Um, we mentioned in passing the Labour Party and its uh, position on, on Europe. Is this new Liberal Democrat position anything more than a slightly um, um, spruced up and um, civilised um, uh, expression uh, of what is now the Labour Party policy of, um, of accepting Brexit and, in, and claiming that it can be made to work? Yes, I think the Liberal Democrats have decided that they wish to be just somewhat more pro-European than the Labour Party without really giving much substance to it. Um, it is a badge, really, of uh, a, a cultural badge of proving that you dislike the Conservative Party in particular and Conservatives, um, and that you um, uh, wish to, to do things somewhat differently. I wish to be more friendly, more um, less critical, um, more open. Um, but it, it doesn't actually add up to anything that would substantially change uh, the position of the United Kingdom. Um, in this sense, the Labour Party is, is perhaps being somewhat more honest. Yeah. Um, the war in Ukraine uh, seems to have triggered um, uh, a new impetus for European integration, which may well play itself out uh, over the next few years. Macron is re-elected, as seems likely. He'll be very eager to press ahead with this agenda and he'll be well placed to do, do it. Um, do you think that uh, a greater degree of integration in the European Union makes it more difficult, more easy, 
more necessary for the United Kingdom to rejoin the European Union? In geostrategic terms, it certainly makes it, it more necessary um, because I mean, it goes back to the, the oldest analysis in British foreign policy almost that a, a, a Europe united without Britain is a Europe united against Britain. And uh, the, the danger of our being detached from the levers of power in our near uh, abroad um, and losing influence over the, the processes that will decide our fate uh, in that context is a very serious matter. And I think the, you're right, the, the, the current crisis and, and in, in a way the COVID crisis before it has substantially uh, accelerated the process of European integration. Um, both with regards to monetary union and the um, prospects of uh, joint debt in, in various forms of some form of fiscal integration. Uh, in defense, obviously, uh, I think it, it's now very clear after the German initiatives and uh, um, with Macron um, being reelected, as you say, um, that a European defense pillar inside NATO, which will be um, the equal of the United States in, in, in terms of, of, of influence and in terms of industrial weight uh, as well. Um, that is a very real prospect and the danger is that we would be shut out from that. And of course, we could um, join this through the NATO procedure in, in a sort of semi-detached way, but it would not be um, a, a position of, of equality um, with our partners. It would be very much as a... Um, as a, a supplicant, uh, and um, and that is not a position that is worthy of of, of Britain, um, and certainly not in our interests. But the question of whether it makes it domestically, politically easier or more difficult to rejoin, if the degree of integration achieved is greater than it is now. Well, the received wisdom is that um, it makes it more difficult, and, and this is the the. the the, the normal um, analysis um, that one hears from pro-Europeans, um, that where we may be trying to move back towards the EU, but the EU is moving forward faster and the gap is actually likely to grow. Uh, and this is obviously particularly true of, of the single currency, which is the, the key issue, it seems to me. But on the other hand, I think it you could get a situation. I think it would require a crisis, maybe a combination of an economic crisis and a constitutional crisis to do with Ireland and Scotland um, in particular, uh, which could lead to a, a very sharp reversal of opinion, a realization that this has actually been a, a catastrophic error. And if one has made a catastrophic error in life, um, the quicker one reverses it, the better. So you could get. Um, a radical shift of opinion. In fact, I think that is the most plausible scenario um, for rejoining. I think all these ideas that you, you creep up on it slowly or you address other things, you have a progressive alliance, you um, have um, proportional representation, um, you uh, start off down the path, such as the Liberal Democrats are suggesting of um, bit by bit, uh, uh, um, getting closer in, in particular policy areas. I think that is just a complete illusion. Um, this is likely to come in a crisis, a realization that we have taken a fundamentally false road, that indeed our whole semi-detachment um, was since joining was against the underlying strategic principles upon which we did join, which was to ensure that if Europe was integrating, we had to be part of it. Um, and the reversal of that, I think, is that's the scenario in which, um, in which rejoin becomes not just possible, but an absolutely essential, uh, absolutely essential perhaps even to hold the United Kingdom together. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, that scenario does entail a very severe crisis, uh, both economic probably and constitutional. You mentioned the semi-detachment, um, uh, which was very much a, a feature even of pro-European rhetoric before the referendum. 
uh, it was presented as being a clever way to keep British public opinion on side, don't frighten the horses. Um, that didn't work. Um, and I doubt whether there's any particular reason to believe that this extended aspiration to semi-detachment from the European Union um, is, is, is the answer in, 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 in the long term. Um, but if uh, all the major British political parties um, are going down what you and I regard as a, a deluded path um, of thinking either we can remain outside the EU forever or that gradually we can um, become more associated with the EU, does it really matter what the present political parties are saying about Europe? If there's going to be such a, a crisis and a, a, a reversal of, of long-held opinions, um, then won't that involve a restructuring of British politics as well? Well, it will, but um, it will come perhaps at a very high price. And the risks that we are now running with the unity of the United Kingdom and with the strength of our economy and therefore um, the, our capacity to continue as a, a functioning uh, welfare state and um, being able to address the, the very severe divisions inside Britain that undoubtedly led to Brexit, um, our capacity to do so will be greatly diminished and this crisis will uh, therefore be all the more serious. And it is the duty of politicians to uh, anticipate events and to try to avoid disasters, not uh, wait patiently for them to occur and then seek to take advantage of them. Uh, and But the problem is that that is precisely the culture that we have. We have a, a democracy in which um, followership is the principal feature, not leadership. And that has been the whole Brexit story all along, actually. The reluctance to uh, tell the British people some rather harsh truths about our position in the world and, and why European cooperation mattered. Um, and, and our failure to do that um, is, what, is what has led to Brexit. And, and, and you're right. I mean, this is a what we're seeing now is simply a continuation of the not wanting to frighten the horses, not wanting to get engaged, not wanting to take the short term political risks of leading uh, the democratic process, leading the democratic debate, which is the absolute essence of a free society. Thank you very much indeed. I think it's been a, a very stimulating and informative debate. Uh, I think we have on the Federal Trust a number of similar debates and uh, recordings, which I hope will be of interest to our, our followers. Um, and um, we will continue, obviously, over the coming weeks to present you, our supporters, uh, with more and more in the way of information and analysis. And we look forward to seeing you uh, in the not too distant future. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed this latest video. It's one of a series of videos about Europe, about Brexit, and about the future of the European Union uh, from the Federal Trust. Uh, we hope that you'll subscribe to our YouTube channel, and then you'll have notifications of future videos, which I hope you'll enjoy uh, as much as perhaps you enjoyed this one.